the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History has inspired and awed visitors for generations. Exploring life from its very beginnings, the hall moves through time, from life's creation in the seas to the diversity of ancient plants and dinosaurs and the eventual evolution of mammals that now dominate this earth. Let's start our tour in the world of ancient plants. So fossil plants are kind of interesting because when plants live, they fall apart. The leaves fall apart, the leaf fall off, the trees fall down, they kind of rot, the roots are in the ground. And unlike an animal where you know what the skeleton of an animal is, you find a leg bone, you think, well, there must be another leg bone. Animals are symmetrical. Plants tend not to be symmetrical. So they fall, they're falling apart as they live and they're not symmetrical. And you can have big leaves on a little tree or little leaves on a big tree. So it's actually pretty hard to put ancient plants back together again. It's kind of like Humpty Dumpty fell apart and you can't like put them back together again. And sometimes um, plants get preserved in different ways too. Sometimes the leaf gets imprinted as an imprint on a rock or sometimes it gets petrified where the actual three dimensionality of the plant is injected with solutions that have minerals that precipitate on the inside of the plant and preserve the plant in three dimensions. And that's what these giant pineapple-like things are. And these are really obscure. Most people don't know what they are because they're a kind of plant that went extinct 80 million years ago. So if it's hard to put them back together again and they're 80 million years old, no one's ever seen one of these things as a living plant or even has a really good idea what they look like. But what's cool about these things, these are called cycadioids or benetotales, is that they are petrified with silica, which means you can saw them in half and see at the cellular level the internal anatomy of the plant. So you can actually see the cell by cell structure and because of that, you can tell what their biology was. You can see cross sections of their flower-like structures of cross sections of their stems and leaf bases. And even though we don't know what they look like really in real life, we know really well what their anatomy was. These are petrified slabs of wood cut in half and then cut in half by fossil loggers. People use diamond bladed saws to saw stone logs. These logs are over 200 million years old from the Triassic of Arizona from the Petrified Forest National Monument. And they have incredible colors. There's oranges and yellows and, and greens and reds. And those colors are actually all different um, states of minerals that are you, that actually seeped into the wood after it was buried in the sand and as the wood was being replaced with silica, actually the spaces in the pores in the wood was filled up with silica, a lot of those colors were embedded in the wood at that point in time. So it's not the actual color of the wood, it's the color of the petrifying minerals that infilled the wood. And if you go to that place now, it's called Petrified Forest National Monument, but when you go there, all the logs are lying on their sides in sandstone layers, and the sandstones used to be stream beds, so these are basically floating logs in ancient streams. So it's actually not a petrified forest, it's a petrified log jam. So it should be called Petrified Log Jam National Monument, not Petrified Forest National Monument. When this hall first opened up, there was no Burgess Shale exhibit, and that was considered a major hole in the exhibit because there was really nothing about the early life in the Cambrian. There were some dioramas down there, but they didn't cover the Burgess Shale, which is super famous, and we have by far the best collection in the world. So the then collections manager, who incidentally hated dinosaurs, decided to put the Burgess Shale exhibit right as you walk in to the hall to block the view of the dinosaurs, which pleased him no end. And when people pointed this out, the excuse was, well, it will have a bigger impact when they walk around the corner and then see the dinosaurs. And he took great delight in blocking the view, not only with the exhibit, but he put up a giant slab of invertebrate trace fossils called Climacticnites which we call the Kawasaki Memorial Slab because it looks like a bunch of uh, road tracks from a motorbike. What I'm going to miss the most in this dinosaur hall is the early dinosaurs that were collected during the first golden age of dinosaur hunting, which was the late, the latter half of the 19th century and the early years of the 20th century. And we have many historically important specimens starting with the Triceratops hatcher here, but also all through the hall there are specimens from that time. And these specimens really come from a time when American museums for the first time 
really presented dinosaurs to the public and also dinosaur research really took off here in the United States. Well, I like Catcher the best because he really sort of represents one of the fossils from the very first days of the institution's dinosaur collecting. He was collected by a very colorful character, John Bell Hatcher, who worked for various museums over the years. But it's, this specimen was collected when Hatcher worked for a famous dinosaur researcher named O.C. Marsh, who was at Yale University. Hatcher was a phenomenal character. Most people who collect fossils are unusual and somewhat quirky people, but he really took things to a new height. He was, for instance, renowned for being an ace poker player who financed many of his paleontological exploits by going to little towns and basically clean, cleaning them of all the money that they had. And there has been more than one tense situation where he had to hastily depart an area <laughs> because of his poker playing skills. As you can imagine, a lot of people didn't take kindly to losing a lot of money to some outside visitor. <laughs> the reason that we started working on the Triceratops in the first place was back around 1994 or 5, we got a call from security. Um, a woman and her son were standing here next to the Triceratops, <clears throat> and she happened to sneeze, and a piece of his pelvis fell off. And no cause and effect, we don't think, but she was very alarmed and she immediately went to security and uh, they came to us and so we started looking and we like, oh yeah, that was pretty weathered and kind of cracked. And we started looking at the mount a lot closer. It had been up since 1904. So it, it was the, the first remnant or the first representation of a triceratops. And we started looking at it and it was like, wow, this guy is in pretty bad shape. Not, you know, it was, it was there, but obviously pieces were falling off. And so that started us thinking about getting uh, Kathy Hawk's team in here, a conservator, to look at um, a lot of our exhibit mounts to see what kind of shape they're in. And we realized that a lot of them were not doing so well out here. And we knew that sort of anecdotally. We were always coming out here gluing pieces back onto the Camptosaurus or the Stegosaurus. And when you start looking at those closely, you realize that the way they had been erected, they did what they could back in the, you know, the teens, the 20s, 30s, but they drilled straight through bones, um, put bolts in, bolted them right to the steel armature, and the, the fossils just couldn't take that. They're actually very brittle, fragile things. They're not just rocks, things that have turned into rocks. It's a fair misconception. And so um, they're reactive to vibration and humidity and, and uh, temperature fluctuations. And so Kathy's team looked at a lot of the mounts around here and we sort of high graded which ones needed to be done. We needed to conserve them, take them, take them off exhibit, mold them and cast them and put the cast on exhibit. So Triceratops was the first one. And that was kind of the coolest one because we were able to, it's such an iconic specimen and, and dinosaur in general. We were able to draw um, interest from private industry for scanning and we had, a couple, we had a couple companies come in and do scanning. They processed all that scanning data, turned it into the first representation of a, of a digitized dinosaur. Um, this is back around 1999 we started doing the actual scanning. And by 2000, we had a full digital dinosaur that we could pose, um, which was really nice for remounting it. And um, so, uh, we had a company who did that. We had a company who did, um, Hasbro helped us. They made one six scale replicas. Uh, there was one on exhibit of what the pose used to look like and a, a, a bronze skull that people could touch. And we were able to use those really small um, handheld bones of the actual bones and really work out the articulation of how these things went together, the range of motion, um, something, some real things rather than just using trying to use the sculpted real things or, or full-scale things. So we think what we got was a fairly accurate articulation of the mount. And now um, it's being done with almost everything. It's, it's such an easy process now, it, but it, it was a really labor-intensive thing back in, in 1999 and 2000. Um, and so Triceratops was the first thing, and we were able to replicate mismatched pieces. Like this guy was a, 
it was a composite mount. So some of his left side was taken from a different animal that was a different size, or it just wasn't there and they, they fabricated it. We were able to take the right side elements, mirror image them, and then mill them out or, or prototype them out into full scale replicas that then we could put on the mount to make it look real. Like his, his left humerus here, the upper arm bone, was much smaller than the, the original right. And so we just mirrored imaged the right and uh, sculpted this, uh, or, or milled it out of this special material. Another company did that for us. Um, and we did that with his, uh, part of his pelvis there, that big long bone called the ilium on his pelvis. We did that with his scapula, it was just fabricated. And we, we got new real feet for him, so we made him a, a nice full, real sized dinosaur. And the last thing was the skull. The skull came from a different animal but we were able to enlarge it digitally about 10 to 15% um, based on femur length ratios of, of other complete triceratops that we have. And um, we enlarged that, prototyped that, and molded and cast that, and now we have a real full scale uh, uh, size skull that would go with the actual mount. That was a huge project. That, that was like a two year project. It was, it was groundbreaking in many ways. Um, and also showed the utility of three-dimensional scanning um, and we also x-rayed and did all kinds of other stuff to it too and so that started us going once we got that list of mounts that were at risk the stegosaurus mount was the next one in line um, the stegosaurus is the guy with the plates on his back and some of those plates were just held up with two two pieces of um, half round steel half inch wide with two little bolts holding it up and that was holding up like a 20 pound plate. So it was just a matter of time before that thing was going to start falling apart too. So we took him off exhibit, we molded and cast him, put the cast on. The next one was the Camptosaurus that was always falling apart, the adult Camptosaurus. That was a holotype specimen. Um, and those are the name bearers of the species. And so those are really important ones. And we didn't want that one to fall apart anymore. So we molded and cast that one and put that on. And now we're full blown doing all that stuff for the for the new hall. So it was all started by this uh, woman's sneeze, you may say. <laughs> uh, this is the type specimen of Stegosaurus stenops. So it's the original specimen collected for Othniel Marsh at Yale University in the 1880s. And it's in the position it was discovered in, which happens to be the position it died in. So it's mostly intact with the head and the neck and the front leg the rib cage, the back leg, and the plates. And then you can see sort of at the far end, if you look at the far end, the tail has sort of come apart a little bit. Um, it's an important specimen because up till then, it was not really clear how you would put a stegosaurus together, um, especially the plates, what order they went in, did they go in the back, that sort of thing. So this was a pretty important specimen. Uh, in the new hall, we're gonna try and mount this vertically. And the underside, is also free of rock so you'd be able to see both sides of the skeleton which would be really nice so um, we'll see if that comes true uh, but that's the plan at the moment so one funny story to me is is less about being in the hall than it is about the history of the hall so there are three examples of stegosaurus there's this one there's the one behind me to my left which is standing up and then there's a the big paper mache stegosaurus so there's three signs in the hall that describe Stegosaurus, and the three signs do not agree. And nobody here noticed that until uh, like an eight-year-old wrote us a letter and said, um, you have information on the labels that contradicts each other. Uh, which one's right? So um, that's the kind of thing that happens when halls evolve over time in pieces. Well, Stegosaurus uh, is made of paper mache and it's been painted on the outside and it's dearly loved by the public. You can see where they've forgotten about the railing and they've reached over and petted it lovingly and rubbed all the paint off. But uh, this was made by the Milwaukee Paper Mache Works in 1904 uh, for the Louisiana Purchase International Exposition. The story Gene Valen and Exhibits uh, had the story that it was made of ground up, the paper mache was made of ground up money. 
and I was pretty sure that wasn't the case. So I called the Treasury and asked when, what did they make, uh, what did they do with worn out money uh, back at the turn of the century? And they said, well, they used to call it in and wash it. And they could do that several times before the paper currency ever wore out. And so, but then they got to burning it. And it, the, the place they did it was over in Kenilworth. There's a big plant, but the stuff that went up the smokestack was full of heavy metals from the printing process. And so EPA got on them for that. And so they just shredded it. But they didn't start doing that until about the 1960s or 70s. But you could go to a Federal Reserve Bank and you could buy a truckload of ground up money. But that was way after the fact. So I said, well, could you possibly come over here and take a look? So they came over. Well. The hall was empty. It was in limbo for about two years uh, while construction was going on in other areas. And uh, so they came into this dark, dismal hall uh, with planks and dirt everywhere. And the supervisor picked out Gracie. Gracie was the person who was to take the biopsy. And there was a railing, but it wasn't like this. And the Stegosaurus wasn't at this level. It was down. Gracie was an ample woman. And so for Gracie to go over the railing and down in the pit and get on the back side and get a scraping was something that I think he'd been waiting for all his life. <laughs> and so she came up and she said, ordinary paper. My favorite dinosaur is up in the sky because it was originally, those two specimens, Edmontosaurus and Albertosaurus, were originally right over there on the ground. But there was no room for them in the new hall, so they stuck them way up high. And when I found out they were gonna do that, I went to the curator in charge and I said, you can't do that. You know, people need access to it. And back then they said, well, it's already been described and published on, so no one will need to see it. But it turns out the Edmontosaurus is the original type specimen or name bearer for Edmontosaurus inectans, and we have had requests over the years to get to it, and we've had to turn people away. So one thing I know about the specimens in the hall now that I, I know more of than I used to is the history leading up to this exhibit. So we've had a lot of research done on the previous ex exhibitions and the, all the things that went on there. And so, for example, we have two dinosaurs up on the wall, Edmontosaurus and Albertosaurus, and, or Ed and Al, and the, uh, they were elevated up there in the 80s. Um, the Edmontosaurus, though, has been here since before the building. It actually was on display in Arts and Industries building. And it was moved over here, and one of the things that was discovered in the notes uh, were the, the day books, which were literally the journals that everybody kept while they were working here for the government record, um, and the, the day book for moving that specimen into the building, um, which included a part where they dropped the skull of the specimen on the stairs and shattered it, um, and then spent weeks putting it together, which explained to me why it's in such a terrible shape. I never really understood what had gone wrong, because it's a very nice specimen with this horrible mangled up looking head and it's because they dropped it on the way in the building. My name is Advait Zucker and I'm a volunteer here at the Fossil Lab at the museum and I'm currently working on a project for the curator of Dinosauria, Matt Carano. I'm sorting through a, a whole bunch of micro uh, fossils that O.C. Marsh, one of the founders of, of American paleontology, collected back in the 1800s. These were found in Wyoming in a formation that's about as old as the, uh, as the rocks that the new uh, T-Rex came from. So all of these animals are, are, uh, con are contemporaries of the T-Rex. 
uh, I'm s sorting through them and I'm classifying them, trying to figure out what animals lived alongside the T-Rex. And, second uh, and uh, secondarily, I'm also doing some morphometric analyses on the small meat-eating dinosaurs from this formation. Of course, all of the dinosaurs are cool, but I'm really interested in some of the, the smaller animals that lived around 530 million years ago in the Cambrian. So the Cambrian is where you see the first explosion of, of a complex multicellular life. Um, and some of the, the animals that we find there are really, really strange. Like they've, they've got five eyes and, and, some, and, so, and some of the, the animals that we find back there are just so different from everything that we see today. And some of them don't even exist today, some of the groups that, that we find back then. Hi, I'm Carol Houghton and I'm a living fossil because I cut the ribbon at the opening of the 1963 Fossil Hall, which is a predecessor to the current hall now being dismantled. And I just wanted to talk very briefly about my father's favorite specimen. My father was Nicholas Houghton III, curator of fossil reptiles, and his specialty was mammal-like reptiles. And the specimen behind me, Thrinaxodon leorhinus, is a meat-eating uh, representative of that group. And he collected it in South Africa, I believe, in 1960. And it was such a beautiful, exquisite little specimen that he nicknamed it Baby Doll. He loved that specimen. And I have to say it had a bit of, a, of, of an adventure because it was actually stolen from the collections um, sometime in the 60s and was a, by, by, I believe, a volunteer who was a real fossil nut. And uh, the FBI actually eventually tracked it down and returned it after, I believe, a year and a half or something like that. It was only slightly damaged. But anyway, we were all extremely glad when it was returned. Uh, this specimen, which is uh, Daptocephalus lianiceps, which means um, lion-headed devourer head or something along those lines, is a mammal-like reptile and um, despite its name it was a peaceful vegetarian. And this is my favorite specimen. And the reason why is uh, because I had a very small hand in collecting it. Um, so the story behind this is my, um, my father brought his family to South Africa, to the Karoo Basin, um, to collect fossils for a year because that's where you find the, the best um, mammal-like reptiles in the world, and that was his specialty. So uh, we spent about nine months uh, mainly in the field going from uh, ranch to ranch and collecting fossils. We were living in tents and uh, of course we would get permission from the ranchers and they were invariably hospital and hospitable and happy to um, have us. And um, so what we would do is we would just spread out and walk around looking on the ground uh, for uh, bits of bone because you don't just go and start digging when you're looking for vertebrate fossils. You actually look for surface expression. So you um, pick up a piece of bone and that might lead you to another uh, piece of bone. So that's what we were doing. One day, my mother and I were walking up a dry stream bank, uh, a stream bed, which is um, um, <clears throat> the Karoo Basin is, is a desert. So um, there's lots of rock and um, exposed and dry stream, stream beds are a real, really good place to um, uh, find fossils because you have uh, constant erosion. So uh, I, I bent down and I looked down and I picked up a, a piece of bone and I showed it to my mother and my mother was excited. So we started walking up this dry stream bank picking up these little pieces of bone. And the stream bank um, went curved to the right and I for some reason went off to the left my mother continued up the stream bank and in about two minutes I heard her say very sharply, Carol, come here right away. You must see this. So I ran up to see what she had found and I found up she had she had found this entire skull and skeleton of Daptocephalus spread right across the stream bank, completely exposed. Uh, the head 
the uh, forearms, the ribs, the, um, the back. And this is extremely unusual to find uh, a fossil in, in this uh, position, in this condition. Usually you just find a small piece exposed and then you have to excavate it. And um, so when I saw the specimen, I let out this shriek, as only a 10-year-old girl could, and my father was in earshot. And he immediately thought, oh my God, somebody's been bitten by a snake, because there are a lot of um, poisonous snakes um, around in, in the crew. And so he comes rushing over, and he sees this magnificent specimen, and he's just tremendously excited. And he, he starts saying, oh my gosh, this is incredible. So the first thing he does is he says, I've got to get a picture of the discoverer of this specimen, my, my mother, Ruth Houghton. And um, so he sets her up with her boot resting on the skull of this um, Daptocephalus. And she's, she's standing looking very proud. She's carrying a, a marsh pick, which is the tool of the trade, and wearing a basuto hat, a straw hat, to keep the sun off her eyes. And um, so this is the specimen. This is the very same specimen laid out, as you can see, uh, almost uh, completely preserved and quite spectacular. In the mammal hall, there's a series of murals, each associated with a group of skeletons. All these things come from Western North America, and it turns out that Western North America is perhaps the best place in the world to look at the evolution of mammals after the extinction of the dinosaurs. So this room has got a series of different time periods represented. And the one I'm standing in front of here is the fossils from the Green River Lake basins of Western Wyoming, Northwestern Colorado, and Eastern Utah. The painting shows a, a lake, a swamp, and these lakes were huge. These were the Great Lakes of the United States between about 45 and 50 million years ago. Some of them covered in areas large as the entire southwestern corner of Wyoming. And they are great places for the preservation of not only the big animals that are living next to the lakes, but the lakes themselves produce fossils of things like birds and fish and snakes and turtles, and amphibians and lizards, and plants. Often the plants have great evidence that the insects were chewing on the plants. Sometimes the plants and the insects are found in the same slabs. And this allows for a really detailed reconstruction of this world that here is reconstructed as sort of a, a swamp. And uh, you can see the, the bald cypress trees, these flamingo-like birds, a variety of extinct uh, mammals. These are mammals that are from the, um, the Bergerian and Uinta land mammal age. This guy is this weird saber-toothed herbivore called Uintotherium. He's got these great big saber teeth, but all of his other teeth are actually plant chewing teeth. So he's a great big rhino-like beast from a, a group of animals that went later extinct, um, preserved as probably the biggest animals on the shores of the lake. The painting itself is kind of interesting because it sets the tone for this hall where you have murals where every single known animal or mammal is shown together in the same painting view. This is not what you'd see if you were walking on the side of the beach today. You'd walk along a beach and you'd see the beach, you'd see the trees, you'd see some birds flying overhead. You'd be pretty surprised to see an animal walking by. And what we see in all these murals are great agglomerations of every single known animal all in one particular spot. It turns out that turtle fossils are really common. Turtles live in these shells that are just like little homes, and they live in places like ponds and streams and rivers. So they actually are living in places where sediment's being deposited. So if you think about it, they're living in their own coffins and they're living in their own graveyards because they are animals that are predisposed to being fossilized. As a result, when you're walking around in western Wyoming or southern Wyoming, you'll often find little chunks of fossil turtle. We often joke that uh, turtles used to rule the world because their fossils are so common. It's really just that they live in places where sediments are being deposited and their shells are predisposed to making great fossils. Here are two pretty amazing fossils from southwestern Wyoming. In front of me is a skeleton of a big animal called the Uintothere. These are big, saber-toothed herbivores, tremendous body sizes. Some of them got up to the size of small elephants. Their pelvises were much wider than their shoulder blades. They had sort of a pear-shaped aspect to them. And this group of animals migrated into North America from Asia, were here for about 10, 15 million years, and then became extinct. But they're sort of the iconic early Eocene animal of Wyoming. And this skeleton's been here for a long time, blocking this fantastic 
fantastic fossil behind me, which is a palm frond that was collected from near Fossil Buttes National Monument near Kemmerer, Wyoming, in southwestern Wyoming. This is a spot called Fossil Basin. It's an ancient lake bed, about 50 to 52 million years old, and it has tremendous amounts of fossil fish in it. They're quarried for the fish, but every once in a while, when digging for the fish, they'll find a gigantic palm frond. You can see the stem on this thing is almost as tall as I am, maybe six feet tall, and here's the frond itself. And if you think about Wyoming today, high mountain desert, think back about it was like 52 million years ago, this is a real strong evidence for a subtropical to tropical climate in the state of Wyoming. So palm trees, giant herbivorous mammals, it starts to paint a time where the world was quite a bit different than it is today. I may not have a favorite mural, but one of my favorites is the one behind me by Jamie Turnus. Um, Jamie Turnus is probably the, the grand old master of, of paleo art, and uh, he's, um, he's fabulous in his, his choice of colors and the way the, the movement of the animals and uh, um, the way the animals are interacting, what they're doing, his landscape backgrounds, and so forth. And Jay would start with um, by drawing, reconstructing the skeleton, and then he would take a drawing and, and add the musculature to that, and then he would pose the the animals into some sort of a, of a nice scene where the animals were very very realistic and sort of twisting and turning always and then finally would do the painting. And when Jay finished his uh, doing his murals he donated to the museum a set of one-to-one -one facsimiles of his work sketches and so we have those in our paleo art collection as well as the nice murals that are the final product of his, his research and his work with our scientists. I'm standing in front of what is called the Shadronian mural right now, and this records the time between 37 and 34 million years ago in Nebraska, in Wyoming, in Colorado, and I'm standing with two big perissodactyls. What's in front of me is a, is a rhinoceros called Trigonius, and this was um, this quarry that produced this animal was found in the 20s in northeastern Colorado and was quarried during the depression by the WPA workers and they collected more than a hundred different skeletons from this one quarry. So some kind of herd of small round rhinos called Trigonius ended up being buried in great masses and at the time museums would then find sites like this and trade the animals. They would trade a rhino and this one was clearly traded by the Denver Museum of Natural History to the Smithsonian in exchange for something. Often the records aren't very good, so I don't know what the Smithsonian gave up to get a Trigonia from the Denver Museum. But we know from looking at this skeleton, this one site in Colorado, on, on, uh, on just up by Ray, Colorado, produced literally over 100 of these skeletons and became trade goods for museums across the country. This guy is a, is a titanotheer, a gigantic rhino-sized relative of rhinoceroses. It's also a prisodactyl. Today, prisodactyls include horses and rhinos. This is an extinct prisodactyl, and these great big knobs on its head um, were probably used for just what horns and rhinos are used for today, some sort of uh, mating selection as these animals like, crash into each other. These guys are really common. They're sort of the biggest mammal of the Eocene, and they go extinct abruptly at 34 million years ago at the Eocene-Oligocene boundary. So their, their extinction marks the end of the Eocene period and the beginning of the Oligocene period. The Shadronian Badlands of Nebraska and Wyoming and Colorado also produce a whole bunch of small mammals and we have an array of things that appear for the first time in North America or have been here for a while and have evolved. Things like this little camel, very small camel. This is a small saber-toothed animal. It's not necessarily a cat, it's related to cats. It's called um, Hoplophonius. There are big rodents. Then the most common kind of um, animal are these little sheep or cow-like um, herbivores called oreodonts, these guys and these guys. They're in the mix with some dogs, some true cats, and some small horses, and a variety of different rodents. Occasionally you find uh, tortoises and turtles, and every once in a while there are alligators in this mix too. I um, am very interested in how bones accumulate and create sites where paleontologists can get a lot by digging a little, and so bone beds become a major focus. And there's one right here that represents the accumulation of two species that died together, uh, apparently, or at least their bones were washed together, and those two species are, are um, 
represented as whole skeletons, and they're also reconstructed in the painting that's behind us. And they, their bones uh, accumulated by the thousands, and it's still a little bit of a mystery as to how that happened, why they all died, whether they died at the same time or whether you know, there was some weather disaster. And so one of the ways I study this is to look at how modern accumulations of bones occur in East Africa. So on the panel that was here, there was a picture of a uh, accumulation of very white bones of domestic animals that died in uh, one place in Kenya. And I, I studied those, and I studied them in another ecosystem as well, called Amboseli, where drought killed off a lot of animals recently. So all these, are, it's like a, a detective story, trying to figure out how, how organisms die in the past. And I try to accumulate clues both from the fossil record and from the recent time. I'm standing behind an animal called Stegomastodon, an animal that was here about in North America about 10 million years ago up to about 2 million years ago. And it was one of these many migrations of elephant-like animals that came across the Bering Land Bridge into North America. They're really abundant as fossils because when one of these things dies, it has these great big ivory tusks, giant skulls, huge limb bones. They sort of kick around and most of the fossils you find are in isolated teeth or chunks of tusks or leg bones. But every once in a while they find complete skeletons. This uh, mural is Maternus's next image, the middle Miocene one, and now has a whole host of other animals. You have multiple kinds of elephants at any given point in time in Nebraska, large-bodied rhinos, and in fact, the story of rhino evolution in Nebraska is almost as interesting as the story of elephant evolution in Nebraska, but also these slingshot horned antelope-like animals, a whole variety of horses, giant pigs, a variety of uh, bone-crushing uh, bear dogs, and the most incredible animal of all, in my mind, the ultimately saber-toothed Barbora felis, the great saber-tooth of all time, an animal who had nine and 10 inch long sabers in its mouth that were razor sharp and extraordinarily thin. This was a killing, cutting animal that lived in Nebraska with elephants, rhinoceroses, bear dogs, and a variety of horses and rhinos. The last period, the Pleistocene, the Ice Age, is an amazing time period because it has these animals collectively called the megafauna, or the big animals. Mammoths, mastodons, giant shrub oxes, great big musk oxes, great big moose, huge bison, giant horse-sized bears, saber-toothed cats, huge sloths. All these animals lived in North America and are preserved in places like La Brea, Isolated spots around the country, including places like this amazing discovery we had in Snowmass, Colorado in 2010. But very commonly up in Alaska and the Yukon in the gold workings, where people use hoses and pump fresh water against the permafrost to melt out the gold bearing gravels. And while they're doing that, they encounter tusks and bones of Ice Age animals. Most of the bones in this display come from Alaska and the Yukon where they were collected by the American Museum and for the American Museum in New York and were then transferred here to the Smithsonian. So things like this gigantic mammoth, this huge moose, this amazing bison, Priscus, huge bison. And this is even one of the largest bison. Some of these bison had horn spans up to seven or eight feet in, in width. And these animals all disappear sometime around 10 to 12,000 years ago. More or less coincident with two things. One, the arrival of humans in North America, and two, the end of the Ice Age. So is it a climate story, or is it a human overhunting story, or is it both? In downtown Los Angeles, there's a place near La Brea where oil seeps to the surface and evaporates. It's the city park now next to the art museum. And if you walk out into the lawn in the city park, the oil is evaporating, making a sticky asphalt. And if you walk into it and step into just a little pool of it, your feet get stuck. That's the famous La Brea Tar Pits. It's been like that for almost 30,000 years. And over the time of the end of the Ice Age, between about 30,000 years ago to about 15,000 years ago, it was the world's most famous predator trap. What would happen would be that an animal like this big, ground sloth, the paramylodon, would get stuck 
in the tar, would be unable to move and would be irresistible to this saber-tooth Smilodon cat. And this Smilodon would then pounce on it, it would get stuck, so another saber-tooth would pounce on the pair and it would get stuck and pretty soon you had a sloth that was covered in stuck saber-tooths. And what's amazing is that something like 75% of the fossils from La Brea are carnivores or scavengers. There's vultures, there's American lions, there's saber-toothed, there's coyotes, there's dire wolves. And surprisingly, mammoths, sloths, and bison are relatively uncommon. It's an amazing spot. It is the best place in the world to find the famous saber-toothed cat, the Smilodon. They have found parts of more than 1,600 different saber-toothed at La Brea. The animals like the sloths are a little bit more rare. And uh, the sloths are these amazing immigrants from South America that crossed the uh, Isthmus of Panama and moved into North America. And at, at uh, La Brea, they find parts of three different sloths, Paramylodon, Glossotherium, and Megalonyx. But it is really the saber tooth that tells the story of La Brea. We are here in the former hall called Life in the Ancient Seas. This hall was developed when I first joined the museum as a postdoctoral fellow in the mid-1980s. And the idea was we had this, the other hall that we just saw with the history of life on land. And we really had given short shrift to the history of life in the oceans, which of course is the most important part of life, biologically speaking, because ultimately everything has its roots in the oceans. And today the oceans cover most of the planet. This mural was worked on by a Canadian wildlife painter, Ellie Kish, who had done a lot of reconstructions of fossil communities before. And the idea was, when the public looks at skeletons, they just look at skeletons as these sort of odd, sometimes awe-inspiring objects, but they can't really sort of make the mental transition, say, from the skeleton of this large marine lizard to a once-living animal because most people simply don't know enough about the way animals are built and put together. And so we decided that it would be best to have the fossils against the background where you can actually see an animal fleshed out virtually. So you can see one of these marine reptiles here, another one here, and then you have the skeleton. So you can basically look back and forth. The skull co corresponds to the head, the paddles which have already been taken off this mount, we represent the paddles on this animal rather than limbs. And so it, it all sort of, people can sort of make a little bit more sense of this. Similarly, we sort of created various three-dimensional models, like all the fish hanging overhead there, that serve the same purpose. Usually when you find a fossil fish, it looks like roadkill. It's flat on a slab of rock. And very few people can go from two to three dimensions. That's usually people who make a living as an architect, but most other people cannot do this. Anatomists can do this as well. But you know, we really, in order to effectively communicate about past diversity, we have to come up with ways to animate the fossils, to really sort of represent them as what they were, namely the remains of once living beings. One thing that captures everybody are dioramas. And whether they're simple things that, that you do in a, you know, in a shoebox for school, or our dioramas here that are you know, sophisticated works of painting and, and so on, everybody loves the kind of rubber dinosaurs and the rubber plants. And, it, and they capture your imagination in a way. You, as a person, whether you're six years old or old, can put yourself into that site. Um, so, but one problem with dioramas is that they're always just like one frozen moment in time and they don't really, uh, I think, successfully convey the whole interaction of the ecosystem that I was talking about. So what we're, we're trying to do in the new hall is combine that sort of magical wonder of scale uh, items in a diorama with new technologies and, uh, of lighting effects and perhaps some video effects to make those come to life. And so we really understand the whole interconnectedness of, of uh, animals, plants, atmosphere, and so on with, within a diorama. So I think they'll still have a lot of their, their magic and kind of a, a new 21st century kind of magic that'll capture people's imaginations, but, but um, invite them to learn and really find parallels between ancient worlds and, and our contemporary world.